policy for under $27 a month. That's almost twice the coverage for less than half of what he had paid. If SelectQuote hasn't shopped for your life insurance, you're probably paying too much. For your free quote, call 800-597-0315. That's 800-597-0315. 800-597-0315. Or go to selectquote.com. Since 1985, we shop, you save. Get full details on the example policy at selectquote.com slash commercials. Your price could vary depending on your health issuing company and other factors. Not available in all states. Tato 7, Team Hochberg Traffic Center time. Jim Talamonte. In Bad Eden's delay started Pratt. It's 19 minutes like Hook to Montrose. Outbound 24. In Bad Kennedy, heavy starting at Cumberland. 45 minutes. O'Hare to downtown. Heavier on the express lanes to the locals. Outbound 39 minutes to the airport. In Bad Eisenhower, it's now 52 minutes. 390 to downtown. 38 from Wolf Road. Outbound 35 minutes to 390. Stevenson, an hour and two minutes, 3.55 for Lakeshore Drive, outbound 34 minutes. The Ryan is 40 minutes, 95 to downtown, I-57, 20 minutes, side to the Bird, Bishopport, 30. Being delays on the northbound side of the Veterans Memorial Tollway from the Mountain Toll to Maple. It's about Reagan Tollway traffic, slow 53 to Highland, Adams Tollway tight, 59 Higgins. That's traffic. I'm Jim Calamonte on AM560, The Answer. Chicago's Morning Answer continues next in our one-hour heating and air conditioning weather center. We see clouds today, a high of 36, and a cloudy night overnight, low 29. It's 29 right now. Next news at 8.30 and Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan and Amy continues next on AM560, The Answer. This hourly segment is brought to you by CharlesEquipment.com, keeping you powered up no matter what the conditions. This is Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan Proft and Amy Jacobson on AM560, The Answer. Good morning, Dan and Amy. If you lost the New York Times' David Brooks on removing the president from office, you're in a pretty bad position if you're house managers. Here's what... uh, David Brooks had to say on PBS over the weekend. I was a little less impressed. I mean, the two main arguments were, that's when he directly addressed why this is worth removing. And it was, well, Trump believed Giuliani and not his own intelligence agencies. And he did it out of self-interest. That strikes me as true, not a big crime. And then he said, you can't trust Trump in the 2020 election when China may interfere. But you can't impeach for something that hasn't already happened. And so I, I think the removal part is still a slightly weak case yeah, slightly weak. David Brooks is saying it's slightly weak. It's uh, catastrophically weak is how that should translate into common sense speak. Lindsey Graham was on with uh, Maria Bartiroma, and he went into more detail on the infirmities of the House manager's case, both on process and substance. First process. Witnesses present evidence. So the Nixon impeachment lasted for years. He went to the Supreme Court. The Clinton investigation lasted for four and a half years. So the defense was able to tell the Senate that all the due process given Nixon and Clinton did not exist with Trump. And they made the most stunning of all arguments. They impeached the President of the United States in 78 days. Why? Because they wanted to get it over by Christmas. Why didn't they pursue witnesses in the House? That would require require court action that would delay their goal of impeaching him before the election. Mm. I think that's devastating to the House managers. If you contested a parking ticket, it would probably take more than 78 days. Uh, And then Graham on the substance? So on substance, they told us that the president was unconcerned about burden sharing, that he was not concerned about corruption that the only reason he wanted the Ukrainians to look at the Bidens and look into 2016 election interference was for personal gain. They read the transcript for 21 hours selectively. In the transcript that the House managers never read to the Senate was an exchange between President Trump and the Ukrainian President Zelensky where President Trump was complaining about the Europeans not doing enough and the president of the Ukraine agreed. The president in the transcript from the Ukraine said to the president Trump, you know, you're doing more than the Europeans. It shouldn't be that way. I'm paraphrasing. So the transcript was uh, devastating to their case. Then the witnesses that they called in their case, they took snippets 
of hour-long testimony. And one thing for a young lawyer, if you want to use a piece of evidence from a deposition or a, a tape, make sure that other parts of the tape do not destroy the parts that you used. Yeah. They were able to prove that the witnesses that were called on behalf of the government when you look at other things they said, completely destroyed their case. Think that Gordon the Sondland. president had been concerned about corruption in the Ukraine. He raised it with the past president of the Ukraine, raised it with this president. And when it comes to the meeting, the manager said that the president was telling the Ukrainian president, you'll never meet with me in the White House mm. or any place else unless you give in to my, to my demands. In the transcript, the president of the Ukraine suggested that the president Trump meet him in Poland September the 1st. The president agreed to that meeting and the only reason he didn't go was because of hurricanes and he sent the vice president in his place. Yeah. Within two hours, they devastated the process and substance argument. In addition to that, you also had deputy uh, counsel for the president, Patrick Philbin, uh, talk about uh, Schiff's change of heart on the whistleblower. And he made the point that uh, one of the transcripts from the House investigation has still not made, been made available to the White House defense team, and that's the Inspector General's, the, uh, the Inspector General for the Intelligence Community transcript, his testimony before the House, where he spoke behind closed doors about the bias he thought may be present with the whistleblower. Oh. Why has that transcript not been made available? Why no interest in having the whistleblower testify anymore when Adam Schiff said uh, that it was important that the whistleblower testify even after even after the transcript of the Trump Zelensky phone call was released? So Schiff's claim now is we don't need the whistleblower to testify because we have the phone call. But he was still calling for the whistleblower to testify after the transcript was released. He stopped calling for the whistleblower to testify when there were reports that the whistleblower worked had, for Biden, right? Well, had, yeah. well, worked for Biden, but also had consorted with Schiff staff. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Schiff have, has lost his right to be taken seriously because of his work with the whistleblower and also when he did that mock conversation that he had with himself. But people took that as word that that originally happened. For more on this whole topic and all the rich vicissitudes, we're pleased to be joined by William Jacobson. He's a clinical professor of law and director of the Securities Law Clinic at Cornell Law School. He's also the founder of the very good legal blog for you legal eagles like me, uh, LegalInsurrection.com. He's president of the Legal Insurrection Foundation. Professor Jacobson, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. So, uh, you know, I mean, how do you, what are, sort of, sort of, uh, excuse me, some of your top lines after, you know, a week of this leading with the first uh, offerings from the, uh, the defense team on Saturday? I was able to watch the entirety of the two-hour presentation by the Republicans on Saturday, and as some of the clips you played indicate, it was fairly devastating to the substance of the Democratic case. I think it's... Uh, it's not looking good, uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why we have now the big bombshell like we did in Kavanaugh near the end when it looks like it's over for the Democrats. All of a sudden, there's some uh, accusation made, and that's the New York Times report last night or yesterday on the uh, bo upcoming Bolton book, um, which uh, having read that lengthy, lengthy New York Times report, there's actually almost no substance in it. Um, it's, there's no quotes from the book. There's no specific accusations. It's a conclusion. And this is exactly what happened in Kavanaugh when the hearings were over, when it looked like he was clearly going to be confirmed. All of the sudden, the, um, you know, new accusations come out. And, and I think that's why the Republican senators would be right to be very skeptical about the what's going on here and the demand for witnesses, because John Bolton is somebody the House could have tried to subpoena. They never actually even subpoenaed him in the House. And the courts could have, on an expeditious basis, ruled on whether the subpoena was valid. I mean, there are all these things. And so now they're trying to turn the Senate into an investigatory body, and that's not what the Senate role here is. So I think the Democrats are in a lot of trouble. Their only hope is they can stretch this thing out, get more uh, media bombshells that stretch it out. And I think that's what they're about. I think they know there's no way 
based on what we know so far that Trump is going to be removed. Well, I mean, Democrats seem to so desperate. They leaked that Lev Parnas, to, you know, recording over the weekend, and they're trying to me try this in the court of public opinion. That's right. And the Lev Parnas tape is really a whole lot of nothing. Trump has publicly said he didn't like that ambassador. It's his right to remove an ambassador and to appoint ambassadors. So Lev Parnas comes out with a tape where Trump says he doesn't like the ambassador. There's literally zero news in that tape, but it's dominated the media news cycle for 48 hours or 72 hours now. This is a replay not just of Kavanaugh, but of the the Russia Mueller investigation. Almost every three to four days, there would be some new bombshell, which amounted to nothing, often was disproven within two or three days, and it was a permanent crisis news cycle. There was always something being rolled out by the media. The New York Times played a huge role in doing that based upon what anonymous people told them somebody else said, so they never had direct quotes. CNN did it a lot. MSNBC much less. They were more opinion-oriented, but there was this permanent permanent crisis news cycle, and that's what we're seeing with the impeachment. But when you get down to it, the, and the Republican two-hour presentation was fairly devastating to the Democrats, and it wasn't just devastating on the substance. It was devastating as to the intent of the Democrats, because the Democrats want Republican senators to take on good faith that if we just call more witnesses, all we're really interested in is getting to the truth. But the Republicans showed that in the 24 hours of presentation to the Senate, the Democrats did not act in good faith because they withheld critical parts of testimony from the witnesses they quoted. So I think they're in a a world of hurt. Really, the only question is sometime later this week, are four Republican senators going to vote to call witnesses and turn this thing into a complete circus in the Senate? As it looks at the moment in time, it does not look like they're going to get four. They might get one or two. Yeah, and uh, not just cherry-picking witness testimony like Gordon Sondland's, uh, cherry-picking uh, holds on foreign aid, as Jay Sekulow pointed out. There were many examples of, in, the present, uh, in President Trump's administration of other legitimate holds on foreign aid, uh, Afghan aid because of concerns with corruption and other examples, Northern Triangle because those countries weren't doing enough to stem the flow of illegal immigration and other such examples. But they also are cherry picking the law. They use U.S. v. Nixon as the basis for impeaching President Trump, um, but they uh, cherry pick the holding in U.S. v. Nixon. They sort of gloss over the fact that the Supreme Court in that case also said in rejecting Nixon's sweeping claims of privilege that uh, a presidential, a narrow claim of presidential privilege may well be justified. And the Wall Street Journal pointed this out saying that uh, from the opinion, uh, uh, a president and those who assist him must be free to explore alternatives in the process of shaping policies and making decisions and to do so in a way that many would be unwilling to express except privately. These are considerations justifying a presumptive privilege for presidential communication. That portion of the Supreme Court opinion in U.S. v. Nixon, uh, the Democrats didn't tackle. That's right. And that's uh, a lot of what goes on here is that they bring in you know, inapplicable precedent or they misstate what it is that, you know, president probably would win in court on John Bolton's testimony being subject to executive privilege. I mean, he was the, about as close to the president as you can get. And if a president is going to be able to confide in his senior most advisors, he's got to ha- he or she or whoever it happens to be in the future has to have an understanding that that is private. Otherwise, you will never speak to your closest advisors. So I I think Trump would probably win. I don't think Trump would win in the sense of that Bolton doesn't have to show up to testify. But I think he would win the the president, once Bolton shows up, could assert executive privilege to prevent, uh, you know, testimony as to private conversations with the president. So I think and I think that's why the Democrats didn't go to court. They could have gotten from a district court a fairly quick ruling. I think they probably could have gotten a ruling within two or three weeks and then an appeals court ruling within a week or so after that. So within a couple of months, they could have had all the rulings that they needed. And the Supreme Court would have would have ruled on a temporary basis as to what 
would happen. So this notion that it would be years and years and years before they'd get a ruling on this witnesses, I think is false. They didn't even try, and they didn't try because I think ultimately they knew that the key people they claimed to have wanted, Mulvaney, uh, Bolton, and a couple of others, are so close and so senior in the administration that they never would have been allowed to testify anyway. The, the other thing, just going back to the Lev Parnas bombshell uh, uh, audio video that uh, surfaced over the weekend, so that was from a dinner in April of 2018, and he was saying, get rid of Marie Ivanovich, the ambassador, I'll get rid of her tomorrow. Well, wait a second, that's a year before Joe Biden announced he was running for president. So I guess President Trump's perspective with respect to U- Ukrainian policy wasn't all tied up in, quote unquote, getting dirt on a political opponent. Now, Trump doesn't like people who are disloyal to him and who don't like him. And the reports he was getting, whether they're true or not, is that this ambassador was disloyal to him, was an Obama holdover, was undermining his policies. And he had every right as president to say, I want an ambassador who actually supports my policies. And I think he was entitled to that. And the fact that, as you, as you indicate, a year earlier he expressed that view actually hurts the the Democrats, because it shows it wasn't tied into Biden running for president because he wasn't even running at that point, And it wasn't even clear he would run. Well, what about real quickly the accusation that President Trump doesn't know Lev Parnas? Because, you know, in picture after picture, I know the Trump called him a groupie. Um, but do you, do you buy that he didn't know him? I guess it depends on the definition. I mean, politicians go to events. There are people there. They don't necessarily know, but are there, and there might be people who are there repeatedly. If there, is there some evidence that he knew him more than as somebody who showed up at his events? I think that's the question, and I don't know the answer to that. I haven't seen that evidence yet, because that's you know the problem we live in with this Twitter culture is that mm-hmm. somebody always digs up an old photograph, and a politician in the course of a year, somebody like Trump, could probably meet thousands of people and gets this photograph taken with them. I mean, look at Elizabeth Warren. Her whole big thing is that she takes has taken whatever it was, a thousand selfies or a million selfies, whatever the number is. The fact that she had a selfie taken with somebody doesn't mean she knows them. Uh, maybe that person showed up at multiple events. So there, I've not seen the evidence yet that Trump knew Parnas in the way that we would associate with that word that they had some sort of personal or business relationship beyond Parnas being part of a group of people who from time to time would show up at events with Trump. Well, but but also, how, how is it relevant to what we're talking about, removing a president from office? This is what this is. What, you know, did he he said he didn't know Lev Parnas. So now we're going to go down this rabbit hole of did he know or didn't he know Lev Parnas? This is what the D.C. press corps wants you to do. Who cares if he knew him or not? What does that have to do with removing a president from office? Exactly. What's the evidence that Lev Parnas has? It's it's almost non-existent. And who is Lev Parnas? I mean, this is a guy who's under indictment for making false statements to the government. I mean, this is the quality of witness that they're they're bringing forward. So I think the whole thing, it's just Kavanaugh all over again. You remember that there was the report of Kavanaugh by an anonymous person through Sheldon Whitehouse's office, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse's office, referred to the government about a sexual assault on a boat in Rhode Island. Turned out to be a complete fabrication. Right. But it was one of several things that came out at critical moments that led to a 48-hour or 72-hour media news frenzy to try to slow down the Kavanaugh confirmation. And I think that's what we're getting. I would expect that tomorrow there'll be some new nonsensical bombshell. I mean, really, people need to read that New York Times article. There isn't a single quote in there from the book. It's what certain people who say they've seen the book, how they characterize it, and then the New York Times characterizes it. It's not even third-hand hearsay because nobody told the New York Times a quote from the book. So it's And this is now dominating it. This comes out at a critical juncture, just like it did for Kavanaugh. This is the Democrat playbook on how to oppose Trump. Use the media to your advantage to roll things out and disrupt what's going on. It's just too bad that Michael Avenatti's in federal custody. Otherwise, he could insinuate himself back into this process, and that would be fun. He'll be in court today. I'd certainly like to hear from him. Uh, William Jacobson, clinical professor of law and director of the Securities Law Clinic at Cornell Law School, founder of LegalInsurrection.com, which is must-reading, and president of Legal Insurrection Foundation. Professor Jacobson, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Great. Thanks for having me. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. 
before you see it on TV. Share it on Facebook or read about it in the paper. Hear it 